Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome you all to the next lecture in this uh, course, which is Democratic Processes and Social Movements in India. This lecture is titled as Caste and Class in Indian Politics. We all are aware of the fact that Indian society is broadly constituted around the principle of caste. From throughout the length and breadth of this country, wherever you go, you find that there is always this issue of caste which is attached to the human existence. And this is for the last long time to go that it's continuing in the society. We are always as human beings in India born with a certain caste attached to us. And it continues in our existence throughout. From different kinds of caste certificates to our caste identity in the social realm, to our identity as a caste person within the political realm is always carry forward. Even the Indian constitution recognizes the fact that Indian society is constituted largely around the issues of caste and thus the provision of reservation is very much fundamental part of the Indian constitution. It is in this context we also find that the Indian society is divided into various classes. Generally, the dominant understanding about class in the society is around the principles of the upper class and lower class. But in the recent past, more so after uh, globalization in the Indian society in 1990s onward, that we find that a new class in the form of middle class emerged in India and has significantly changed and transformed the political, economic and social realms. Keeping all these facts at the back of our mind, we will see in this lecture that how caste and class plays very important or significant role in terms of shaping and forming the democratic processes and democratization in India. The transition from the non-hereditary Varna to the hereditary Jati marks the transition from the early tribal slave society to the feudal societies before India was colonized. Now this statement is very important and crucial to understand that we all know when one starts understanding the issue of caste in India that we need to maintain the distinction between the idea of Varna and idea of Jati. The concept of Varna is non-hereditary. In the ancient times, the idea of Varna was broadly constituted around the principles of the division of labor. So once Varna gets decided or assigned to one's identity or one's uh, human existence on the basis of the kind of work one does. But over a period of time, the society underwent certain changes and it happened so that this Varna got transformed into from non-hereditary to the hereditary aspect of organization of the social component and changed into the idea of Jati. So the transformation from Varna to Jati is primarily the transformation from non-hereditary to hereditary organization. And in this process, a very significant change took place in the Indian society in the form of feudal, feudalism emerged and eventually India got colonized and this process of fortification of or concretization of the issue of Jati continued. Even when Britishers came to India, rather than acknowledging the idea of Varna, they gave importance and acknowledged the issue of Jati 
and the census which took place in India always tried to figure out the residents of this country of this geography in terms of various castes or jati in which they are divided. Thus one can see and uh, conclude safely that the political processes in India are deeply enmeshed with the issue of jati. And how is it so? As I said that it is not only in the post-independent but even during the pre-independent time, Britishers recognize this fact that Indian society is divided around different caste lines. Post-independence, the political leadership in India in different political parties also realize this fact that the society is divided on different ascriptive identities and thus it is easier for the political parties and political leadership to mobilize people by invoking different castes. And that's how caste and caste mobilization came into picture in the post-independent democratic processes and democracy in India. With that, of course, because the caste identities are getting invoked and caste identities are getting channelized into mobilization of people for voting and electoral outcomes, that the issue of representation and thus reservation also came into picture. We all know that reservation for SCs and STs was given in the Indian constitution. In addition, in 1919, reservation to other backward classes, which were the constituent of diverse caste groups, also took place in the Indian constitution. And eventually it happened so that around 50% of the seats in the government jobs were reserved for different castes. In the pre-independence, caste relatively more dominant trope of national politics and discussed in detail. Now, when I am stating that in the pre-independence India, the, it was the issue of caste which was the dominant trope within the political system, I am trying to basically highlight that the issue of class was not at the center of the whole imagination of political processes in India more so till 1920s and 30s. It is only with the coming of the communist parties that the issue of class also took important uh, center stage in the political imagination of India. And eventually it happened so that the mobilization of people in the political processes in India in 1950s and to 90s, say 70s or 80s happened largely around the idea of lower class, upper class binary. Class as a vantage point to explain politics in India entered late in the political lexicon in the 1920s as I have already mentioned this. If you can recall, it was in 1925 that for the first time Communist Party of India was formed. And we know that the, those who subscribe to this particular uh, political ideology of left, they make sense of society not in terms of the ascriptive identities of caste or tribal backwardness, but basically in terms of the economic division of the society around the principle of class. As a backdrop, we need to understand that there are unique aspects of caste and class in Indian politics. Now, what are those unique aspects of caste and class in Indian politics? This is something which is very important to understand and make sense of because that way only we will be able to highlight that how the issue of caste and class has not only feed into the political processes and democratization of politics in India, but has also got transformed in the process of interacting with the political processes. To start with caste, in its diverse form of Varna and Jati is ancient. This is something very important to highlight and understand that the idea of caste is deeply embedded in the fabric of Indian society. Why is it so that the idea of caste is so deeply embedded in the Indian society? One of the reasons is that caste is ancient in the either in the form of Varna or later on in the form of Jati. Thus, 
all the aspects of human existence in terms of social, economic, cultural, they are largely shaped and guided by the issue of caste. You find that from naming a baby on its birth to the last right of a dead person, all the aspects, all the processes in terms of cultural practices, social practices are largely guided by the idea that one belongs to which particular caste. Because of this, there is deep rootedness in the collective social psyche of the society. Similarly, on the other hand, we find that class in comparison to caste in the Indian society, the idea of class is a modern category. It is a modern category in the sense that class identifies one's identity in terms of an individual who has certain kinds of economic resources or there is absence of certain kinds of economic resources. Those who have good amount of economic resources to their disposal, they belong to the upper class of the society or the rich class of the society, while those who are who have only labor in terms of selling it in the market and do not necessarily own any means of production or necessarily own any capital, they are supposed to be considered as the lower class of the society or the poor section of the society. This framework of understanding the human society in terms of class description or class identity is something which is modern and can be easily identified with the Western society. It is only with the coming of the Britishers and with them the idea of modernity and modern ideological principles or formulas that certain Indians also started making sense of Indian society on the class line. Interestingly, the Indian political process or Indian politics recognizes both caste and class as important component and both have played crucial role in shaping the structure and function of the Indian political system for so long. Thus, as you can see, that Indian politics is not only limited in terms of translating the caste identity into political outcome, but it has also for a very long time, more so from 1950s to 80s, has interacted with the whole issue of class and has given shape to the idea of politics in India. From political party formation to political workers recruitment, all aspects of electoral politics in India is deeply enmeshed in caste and class dynamics. Thus, it is important here to highlight that how the formation of political parties in, in India and the recruitment of political workers, they are always guided by this calculation by the political parties that whether to whom they are recruiting or inviting to join their parties, they belong to which caste and class. Keeping in mind that both caste and class work as a kind of a political resource for them to mobilize for the vote. Going further into the understanding of caste and class as the determinants of politics in India, we will look into the different components as the de determinants of political processes in India. Caste, despite several changes in its operational features, continues to determine the following aspects of politics in India. We know that caste, as I, I, I have already discussed, has shifted or changed over a period of time. Earlier, it was recognized as Varna. Later on, it became Jati or uh, caste and that caste also got fragmented into various sub components in the form of what we now call as the other backward classes or OVC caste. They have in their own ways have shaped the politics in India and the whole dynamics of political processes in India. Some of the manners in which they have shaped the political processes in India are as follows. One, the caste and class dynamics in India has influenced the political participation. Thus, you can see if you look into and analyze the voting behavior or the voting pattern in India since 1940, 
51 in all the general elections and the regional state elections we find that there are certain castes who are or certain ascriptive groups who are participating in the political processes more in the over a period of time in comparison to the others in other words there are caste groups who participate in the political in the voting in the political processes more wholeheartedly in comparison to others and there is always this caste aspect as well as the class aspect the dominant general understanding is that the upper class upper caste are politically not very charged or politically not very motivated in terms of voting and going out to vote in comparison the lower caste lower class people they find it necessary and something significant in terms of in going to vote and influencing the political outcomes in the form in terms of formation of the government because they know that it is only through their participation that the political outcomes can be determined similarly in the electoral processes in terms of seat distribution in terms of political parties giving ticket to different sections of the people the class and caste always determine that political parties are going to give ticket to whom they always take this into considerations that how giving ticket to a particular individual from a particular constituency can influence the result outcome similarly the participation of certain caste and class in the political processes also influence the political culture of india if you compare the nature of political culture in india in 1950s and 60s when generally the upper caste upper class educated urban people were mainly the part of the political rank and file of political parties more so of congress that over a period of time 1970s 80s onward and more so in 1990s we find that not necessarily those leaders who belong to the upper caste class educated started participation in the political processes and eventually moved on to become the chief minister in various states or they eventually became the top leaders in their own political parties samajwadi party bahujan samajwadi party rashtriya janata dal or janata dal they are some of the significant examples that how the they have changed and influenced the political culture of india by ensuring that people from the so called lower caste and lower ca class uh, sections are not only participating in the political processes but they are also getting the due advantages in their own rank and file and eventually turning into the chief ministers and ministers in the cabinet i have already mentioned that voting behavior in india is also largely shaped by the fact that the voters are not only the individuals who are citizens of this country and thus their name is there on the voting roll but also the fact is that they belong to certain ascriptive identities in terms of caste and thus the voting behavior is many a times shaped by the fact that they belong to a particular caste political parties are always well aware of this fact that different caste groups have different voting patterns and thus it is important to manage those votes of different caste groups in the different men in different manners similarly the social and economic mobilization in the society is also largely shaped by the fact that the social and the economic uh, aspect of particular caste and class will always contribute significantly in terms of bringing people to the political processes and in terms of their active or passive participation in addition most importantly if you find the voting patterns in the national elections and in the regional elections in the state elections we find that in the regional aspects in the regional politics 
the issue of caste is something very significant and it plays very important decisive role in voting. At times it happens so that during the national elections, if certain states also are undergoing the assembly elections, that the same voters are voting differently. So they are choosing one party for the national election on the same day, but they are choosing the other party for their uh, state uh, assembly, keeping in mind that how the caste equation is taken care by the regional party or by the national parties. In addition, upper caste, lower caste, binary. If you uh, make try to make sense of the political processes and the democratic democratization of politics in India from the vantage point of caste, you find that very often we come across this binary of upper caste and lower caste. And this binary plays and has historically played very important role in terms of shaping the political outcomes in India. Earlier, the framework or this binary was in terms of purity, pollution, or touchables and untouchables. That, but that kind of framework was more dominant before the independence in India and in the first decade after the independence. Eventually, it happened so that this binary got vanished and it now got replaced by largely the framework of upper caste, lower caste, and the middle caste in terms of OVCs. Going beyond that, the caste class relationships, we find that high or upper caste are those which enjoyed, enjoyed the dominance over economic resources. Thus, you can see that the other framework of making sense of this binary of upper caste, lower caste is that if you go further in terms of defining it, a few political scientists, social scientists have make sense, have made sense of this binary also in terms of bringing the intersectionality of caste and class together to argue that generally it happens so that the upper castes are also those who belong to the upper class and similarly the lower caste people belong to the lower class and this kind of constitution of caste and class together greatly shapes the political outcomes in India. But I would like to now here highlight that this kind of understanding may have relevance in explaining the politics in India from 1950s to 1980s. But after 1980s, it happened so that the political processes in India underwent significant tectonic shift. And we find that it is only in 1990s that new regional parties emerged and the new political processes emerged, which were not conforming to this kind of understanding of upper caste, upper class, as one group and lower caste, lower class as another group within the political processes. Going further, class as an economic category affects democratic processes in India at the various stages of its functioning. So as we, in the previous slide, we saw that how caste as important component affects the uh, or plays important role as the determinant of outcomes in the political processes in India. In this slide, we will see that how the process of class plays very significant role. During the freedom struggle, caste and class were at the intersection of political rights. Thus, who will get what, when, and how? This was central to the whole discourse of idea of politics in the pre independence India, and both caste and class were considered as the determinants by 1930s and 40s. Thus, you can recall the way Ambedkar intervened into this whole politics of recognition or politics of uh, ensuring that the lower caste people also get their due in the political as well as the economic resources is something which needs to be underlined in terms of intersectionality of caste and class. At that time, the life chances of a citizen in the society was largely determined by his her economic condition as well as by her membership of a particular social group. Thus, as you can recall, that at that point of time, within the political economic realm, it was a general understanding that the life chances of people are not only necessarily decided by their economic situation in the society, but also by the caste factor 
the caste group to which one belonged. But immediately after the independence, 1950s, these kind of issues were brought under the broader umbrella of Nehruvian dream of socialist pattern of society and economy. Nehru's vision or Nehru's understanding of this kind of ascriptive identity as problematic to the political outcomes and the political democratic processes in India led to this uh, understanding of the government that if one need to eradicate the problems of poverty along with the problem of caste discrimination in India, then the only way is to organize the society around along the economic principles of just divisions of resources. As we have seen in the other lecture, that it was because of this Nehru's consensus, Nehruvian consensus around the policy of mixed economy of ensuring that the through planning, the economic resources needs to be distributed, employment needs to be generated, more people need to be engaged away from the agriculture sector to the industrial sector and thus planning has a very important role to play in this process that India went on with the socialist pattern of society as the ultimate goal. And it was in this process that heavy industrialization and modernization of the society was something which was significant to give meaning to the equitable or just distribution of resources. The communist parties of, in India were largely influenced by the kind of politics which was unfolding in the USSR and in China as the two models of progress other than the liberal capitalist model of the US. But as we know that over a period of time, that kind of understanding started fizzling out by the end of 1960s, a new politics started emerging in India. After the death of Nehru, the political churning in India took a new shape. New political aspirations started emerging. It was in the backdrop of the Green Revolution. It was in the backdrop of China War. It was in the backdrop of Pakistan War of 1965 that the dream of uh, Nehruvian politics started shattering and those new economic classes who were also uh, belonging to certain caste groups in uh, uh, the northern India part where the re Green Revolution took place, that they had, a new uh, they had new resources in their hand, that they started making sense of their political participation. And thus, a new kind of mobilization, farmers' mobilization along caste and class line that shaped the political processes in India. It challenged the dominance of Congress within the political process in India. And it also happened so that, interestingly, for the first time, the political parties and political processes in India realized that caste is playing a very significant role in terms of mobilizing voters to come out of their home and cast their vote. For a particular political party, understanding that they can best safeguard their interest in comparison to Congress. Rajni Kothari, a famous political scientist, in his work, Caste in Indian Politics, argues, and this is a very interesting argument, so you please pay attention to this, that it is not the caste alone which influences the politics. Politics also transforms the caste and affect its solidarity and hierarchy. Thus, in other words, casteism in politics and politicization of caste, two sides of the same coin. We need to elaborate this understanding of what Kothari is saying in this statement in his book, Caste in Indian Politics that over a period of time it has happened, it happened so by 1970, that caste started playing a very significant role in the political process. Because of this active role of caste as a social ascription, playing important role in the political process, that both things, two things are happening. On the one hand, caste is 
playing significant role in the political outcomes, in the electoral politics, in the distribution of seats, as well as the number of members of parliaments and members of legislative assemblies who are winning the elections, they are coming or they are belonging to the particular caste groups who were hitherto for a very long period of time were not necessary part of the representative politics in India. Thus, we can say that there is a casteism in politics which was playing the significant role or politics getting casticized. But on the other hand, and this is very interesting um, highlight by Kothari, that not only this, the caste itself is undergoing many transformations. Thus, we have the politicization of caste also taking place in the Indian society. What does this mean? What, what is this aspect of politicization of caste? Kothari highlights that not only caste influences the political outcomes, but the caste is also getting aware of in itself the fact that if the people will be more conscious about their caste ascription, they can use their identity not only to register their grievances or register their problems, but they can also control the political processes, the political power, and thus they can transform the outcome of politics in India. In short, we can say that politics in India, the political processes or democratic processes in India took a new turn in late 1960s and 70s when there was not only casticization of politics but also politicization of caste which happened. According to Kothari, these two aspects, casteization of politics and politicization of caste is happening as if both of them are both sides of the same coin. Rudolf and Rudolf, another important uh, social scientist who works on Indian politics, who have worked uh, for a very long time on Indian politics, in their famous book, The Pursuit of Lakshmi, argued that in the post-independent India, in the new context of political democracy, that is electoral politics, caste remain a central premise and focus of Indian society. Thus, their argument is very clear that the political democracy in India, most of the electoral politics, is always conscious about the presence of caste as something which is significant and has important role to play and it remained the central premise and focus of Indian society. Now going beyond this academic understanding of caste and politics in the Indian context and democratization process, we also need to highlight the role of caste in Indian politics in terms of the examples which we can pick from the regional politics. Thus we find that the caste matters in the political socialization and leadership recruitment for a very long time now, and more so after 1960s. And some of the instances we can pick up are that the Jat leadership in Haryana or in Western Uttar Pradesh or the Reddies in Andhra Pradesh, Vokaliga and Lingayat in Karnataka, that all these new caste groups or communities with their ascriptive identities started pushing the boundaries of political participation and ensured that their ascriptive identity in the form of diverse caste group is getting recognized by the political parties and political parties are consciously taking this decision of recruiting those caste groups in their rank and file. Not only this, these political parties eventually gave space and ensured that these leaders coming from the cultural uh, caste ascriptive groups take up the top position in terms of chief ministers and prime ministers. In addition, caste and political parties in India, in the, in the context of North India in post 1980s, are largely organized around the caste identities as caste politics entered into a new phase. Thus, as we see that in the post-independent, the first one and a half decades, when the Congress dominance was there till 1965, it was only the combination of Brahmins, Muslims, and Dalit who formed the major vote bank of 
the Congress party till then, but with the what uh, social scientists have called as the first democratic observes that in 1967, when Congress lost many states, it happened so that the new caste group, the middle caste group in the form of Jats and others started emerging in North India, that the new claimant of power emerged and that shaped the politics. From there till 1980, uh, that kind of dominance of the Jat politics or Yado politics continued in that uh, region, but it again underwent certain kind of changes in late 1980s with the rise of Dalit politics in India, when you see that political parties like Bhajan Samajwadi party came into limelight and gave shape to the new politics of caste in the Indian context. Thus, we can safely divide the whole issue of caste and politics in the Indian context in terms of independence to 1960s, the 1960s to 1980s, and again 1980s onward till 2014. Similarly, in the post-independent India in the South, we have DMK and AIDMK as playing the significant role in Tamil Nadu as the representative of non-Brahmin political groups and they mobilized the electoral politics and democratization of the Indian society along caste lines. Now it is important to understand that caste has various dimensions. Caste considerations are given weightage in the selection of candidates and the appeals to the voters. It is in this process that we find that how over a period of time a political party started getting its recognition in terms of its affiliation to one particular caste group or a set of caste groups to which that political party is comfortable with. Eventually it happens also so that caste as the divisive as well as adhesive force in Indian politics gets recognized and this is precisely what is happening in Indian politics in last so many decades that on the one hand the fractional politics within the political parties as well as within the political realm is divided broadly along the caste lines. In other words, caste is playing both the cohesive force, the adhesive force in the Indian politics in terms of organizing certain sections of people along the caste line, motivating them, politicizing them and giving them the confidence of participating in the political processes and giving them the rights and liberty and the power to be part of the government formation. On the other hand, the caste has also played the divisive role for a very long time in 90s and the decade of 2000 when the division along the caste line transformed into severe violence or at times leading to formation of coalition governments where the stability of the government was always under question. We can say that there is nothing inherent in the caste system that resists all forces of change and thus caste politics has evolved in last so many decades. Now this conclusion one need to keep at the back of the mind while understanding the caste politics in India that caste has nothing inherent, inherent in itself which resists any kind of transformation of politics and thus you can see as I have already discussed with you that in the first phase the Dalit Muslims and upper caste are voting for the Congress but it is because of the internal dynamics within these caste groups it happened so that almost all these groups they moved away from Congress and they joined their respective interest groups in terms of backing one political party or the other over a period of time. The transformation is to that an extent we can say that 180 degree transformation took place in the sense that almost same combination that is of upper caste Dalit and Muslims who were voting for Congress they ended up voting for a particular political party in the Uttar Pradesh elections in 2007 when they came all three together to vote for Mayawati to ensure that 
a political party which was recognized for its Dalit identity in 1990s became the majority party, single majority party in the UP elections. Thus, the one can safely conclude and argue that there is nothing inherent within the caste which stops it from transforming the political outcomes as well as getting itself transformed in the process. Coming to the understanding of caste and Indian constitution as a means for democratization of Indian society, this is something now very significant. That so far we have understood that how caste plays and class plays important role in terms of shaping the political outcomes. Similarly, caste has also played significant role in the formation of the Indian constitution and thus democratization in the sense that the traditional caste structure is supposedly based on ideology of purity and pol pollution. But we all know that how Indian constitution completely checks this whole idea of purity pollution or untouchability and ensures through fundamental rights that nothing of this kind can be practiced in India. Over a period of time, we have also realized that how ensuring certain kinds of fundamental rights to all the citizens of the society through the chapter on fundamental rights that we find that the equality and justice in the society is ensured. In addition, the caste-based reservation also takes care of the class issue in terms of ensuring that jobs are reserved for certain people who belongs to SC, ST and OBC. In addition, to ensure the political participation of different caste groups, Article 330 provides reservation to SCs and STs in the parliament. In addition, Article 332 provides seat reservation in the state assembly. And that's how we see that the political system in India has, since its inception, that is 1947 onward, has always seen the vocal voice of representatives from SCs and STs and more so after 1990s the OBCs as getting due representation in the political parties and as well as in the parliaments and the state assembly. Now moving to the another part of uh, another important aspect of this lecture that is the conception of class and how it influences the politics. Before this our lecture was more focused on the caste dynamics and its interaction with the political processes. The concept of class, whether derived from Marx or from Weber, refers to the significance of economic endowments. That is, whether material means or product of production or possession of particular skills, that is human capital or, or cultural traits, sometimes referred to as the symbolic capital, or social connections, sometimes referred to as a social capital, which influences a person's power. What does this mean? The idea is that the concept of class is largely shaped by or determined by the economic endowment. Now, this economic endowments can have different form. To start with, of course, it means the material means of production, which one controls or possesses in the form of machines or labor or capital. But it, in addition to that, because of the availability of these kind of economic resources, it happens so that individuals also have certain kind of human capitals or certain kind of skills uh, or certain kinds of cultural traits or social connection, which gives them certain kinds of positions in the society. This kind of positioning in the society because of controlling certain economic resources, which gives us this idea of who belongs to which class in the society. Thus, the economic determination of positioning in the society gives birth to this binary of upper class and lower class. Different groups of people broadly share particular metrics according to their positions in the structures of production and distribution through which societies are reproduced. Now, because of belonging to certain kind of classes in the society, that the reproduction of the similar trait continues. So, those who are belonging to the upper class, it happens so 
that the generations which are following in that class, they also end up belonging to the same class. And similarly, those who belong to the poorer sections of the society, they end up having their following generations also belonging to the same class. That's how the more rigid formation takes place that is called that could be called as class structure or what Marx referred as class in itself. Within the left ideological framework or Marxist literature, we find that class in itself is there in the form of class structures. But in addition to that, there, it's important, that's how the Marxist literature put it or the left political parties put it, that it is important that the class which is for in itself needs to recognize that its position in the society is something which is detrimental to the political outcomes or to its rights and justice. And thus, the class must get conscious of its position in the society, then only the class in itself will get transformed into class for itself. And the moment the class will get transformed into class for itself, that eventually it happens so that the society will go for changing the whole class structure and the formation of the classless society. In the Indian political context, as I have already discussed in another lecture, that Communist Party of India was formed in uh, 1925 and that's how around that time in 1910s onward, 20s onward, that we see that the whole idea of class is getting discussed and people are trying to figure out that how well we can organize the political processes in India along the class lines. Over a period of time in post-independent India, Communist Party of India was followed by Communist Party of India Marxist and eventually it also uh, broken into Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist. One important political scientist, social scientist in India, John Harris has written extensively on the class politics in India and the book is also titled as Class Politics in India, which was written by John Harris. And he argues that at various, at various instances, class gets its expression in the form of caste. For instance, poor laborers organize under the umbrella of Dalit. Now, this is important aspect of understanding class politics in India. For a very long period of time, the communist parties in India, they tried to argue and they tried to do their politics on, on this uh, basis of this argument that class is the core of human organization and it is the class which is the fundamental issue or reason around which the politics needs to be constituted and all other issues including caste, gender or religious identities needs to be subsumed under the overarching umbrella of class. Communist parties had this understanding that if one can resolve the problem of class issue in the society by equitable dis distribution of resources and ending and the class formation in the society or eradicating the classes in the society that we can easily eradicate the problem of caste, religion or gender. But John Harris through his writing and later on Sudipta Kabral has also highlighted that how it is important to recognize that it's not necessarily that the societies are or the citizens are getting organized only along the class lines, but it is possible that the what appears to be the organization of class society in India could be the caste mobilization in the sense that both are coterminous. Thus, Poor Dalit, that's how uh, John Harris puts this example that the poor Dalit who are belonging to both the lower caste and the lower class are mobilizing under the larger umbrella of Dalit rather than under the umbrella of poor section or poor people. Interestingly, sometimes the opposite too happens, that is caste block the class consciousness formation. Harris is also aware of the fact that it's not only that the caste is playing 
significant creative role in the formation of certain kind of grouping in the society which can challenge the class formation. He also argues that it, at times it happens so that the interest of a particular caste group overrides the problem of class consciousness in the society and thus it may block the class consciousness. Harris gives the illustration of West Bengal and Kerala in the first case where he argues that how the Dalit organizations or the Dalit movement takes cognizance of the limits of class and the problems of class and thus both go, both go together in the overall organization of the people and protesting against the existing differences. On the other hand, he gives the example of Bihar to argue that how at times the Dalit consciousness blocks the issues of class consciousness and plays negative role in terms of formation of formidable political force which can negotiate with the state. According to Harris, the critical matter for politics is whether or not class consciousness is developed amongst whom and in what ways. Now again I will remind you that one need to be little careful while undergoing and understanding these kind of interpretations of understanding of role of class or caste in Indian politics because we will see in the later part of this lecture that how over a period of time this kind of explanation may not necessarily give us the better uh, understanding of the politics in the recent times and that how not necessarily the voters are getting mobilized only along the class lines or the caste lines but other issues are also coming into picture more so with the coming of the middle caste groups and the middle class groups. A big question concerning the politics of the working class in India is that whether or not those in the organized sector or in the formal employment recognize commonalities of interest with those in the informal sector. One important challenge for those who are doing class politics in India at the moment and this is for a very long time is that the interest of those who belong to the organized uh, economy or the organized formal employment, they not necessarily subscribe to the problems of or the sufferings of those who belong to the informal sector. Now, interestingly, the formal sector are mostly in the urban centers. They are less in number in terms of percentage. They are around less than 10%. On the other hand, the rest of the working population undergoes informal and they are distributed both in the rural as well as in the urban centers and thus it not necessarily and it's not possible to bring both the groups together as one class. Another big concern or question for those who are fighting for class issues is the relationship of different factions of the capitalist class. Thus, you have the upper class rich capitalist and then there are not necessarily so rich capitalist class who are uh, taking in charge of the intermediary economic uh, industrial sectors the interest of both are diverse and thus it's it's not easy for those who are doing class politics to target both with a, in the same manner with regard to india this question has generally been framed in terms of the relationship between agriculture or landed capital and industrial capital between rich farmers and big business. This has been the classic dilemma for the left political parties in India how to address this issue of those who belong to the rich farmers class as again those who are the rich class but on the other hand there are the rich industrialist class who belong to the industrial sector. The political parties in India have always faced this challenge of clubbing both together because the moment you bring both of them together, there is this problem of addressing the issues of agriculture sector along with the industrial sector as both of them suffer from absolutely different kinds of problem. More so, the kind of dependency of different classes of lower class people are there over the uh, these sectors is very different. So if you target or question the upper caste 
upper class farmers in the rural areas not necessarily you will get the similar kind of response from the rural sections of the people who are dependent on those rich farmers in comparison to the laborer who are dependent on the rich industrial class in the urban areas then there is the question of definition of the middle class now this is a new category which has emerged in the indian politics over the last 25 years and more so after liberalization and privatization that this new class is swelling up its number is going up it's almost more than 50 percent now in the indian context and this has largely shaped the political outcomes in india in the last one decade going beyond this if you look into the class structure and class formation in india we need to understand that what rudolf has outlined that the organized labor as a potential actor in class politics in india must contend with formidable obstacles rudolf underlines the limits of labor force in organizing a political mobilization in india because of the following reasons in the first place as is by now generally understood the overwhelming majority of those in the indian labor force are in informal employment unprotected by labor legislation and very little access to social security now this is almost the repetition of what i have already explained to you so i'll not go into the detail that one major problem for those who are trying to mobilize the citizens along the class line is that the there is no one particular class which shares all the issues in common the problem is the division the stark division between formal and informal sectors in india leads to major challenge barbara harris white in her writing estimates that approximately 83 percent of the population works wholly in the informal sector and this is really problematic in terms of the fact that informal sector people or workers are diversified they are not working under one common roof and thus formation of class consciousness among them is very challenging clearly there is great deal of variation in the conditions of life and labor of indian working class and it cannot be expected that a common political class consciousness can at all be easily developed coming to the middle class in indian politics we know that over a period of time as i have already mentioned because of liberalization and privatization that what michael kelly calls as the intermediate class or middle class has emerged in the in in indian economic and political realm and it has certain kinds of advantages in terms of middle class because it it has its say in the job sectors it has its say in the con terms of controlling land as well as in terms of its recruitment by the political parties and thus it has largely became the part of what we call as the overlapping organizations of diverse kinds that is cultural cooperative and philanthropic and the along with trade associations and the, this way they have shaped the political processes in india for very long the class structure in india has over a period of time gone under change the writings of Deshpande and Kaviraj has always highlighted this that how over a period of time there is no one common political language of this particular class which is fighting for its right place in the society has emerged and thus it has created a problem. Coming to the concluding part of this lecture, I would like to highlight that how over a period of time in the decades of 2010 that the caste politics in india started undergoing major transformations and by the time 2014 bjp emerged as the representative of almost all the classes and sections of the people that it has happened so in a particular context of globalization and the middle class politics that diverse interest came together and they backed one political party to make sense of what is going on this has brought a significant tectonic shift in the political processes in india and we need to be careful in terms of using the old concepts and categories to make sense of caste and class politics in india thank you mm -hmm.